Happy Sabbath, family. It's so good that you are with us today, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Wherever you are right now, the spirit of the Lord is with you. I don't want you to think that because you might be at home or in your bedroom, in your kitchen, wherever you might be, that 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 we are not being church. We are being church. I think that this year, this pandemic has challenged us to be more than church attendees, but to be the body of Christ wherever it is that we go. Uh, so let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your spirit and your love. Lord, we're grateful that you have brought us through another week, Lord. We could not keep ourselves. So God, we're so grateful that you kept us, that you kept us in our right minds, that you kept us clothed and you kept us fed and you continue to provide for us. And for that, God, we continue to give you glory. We thank you for your goodness towards us that has never failed and will never fail. Lord, it is our prayer, it is our hope that we would be more faithful to you, that we would put our hands in your hand, Lord, and that we would trust you as you guide us along the way. Lord, I pray that you would bless this service, bless all those who are tuning in, who are watching and attending, Lord. And God, we just pray that your spirit would fill our hearts and that we would be transformed in this time and in this space. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to welcome you all for uh, just uh, welcome you all to the Cambridge Seventh-day Adventist worship service. Uh, so glad that you're with us on this Sabbath morning as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. You may have recognized or realized that we are in the month of February, which means we are celebrating celebrating Jesus and we're celebrating uh, Black History Month as well. 
And some of you might be wondering, wh why are we celebrating Black History Month? Well, one, we're celebrating Black History Month because we see that the Lord has uh, given us a, a, a mandate to serve those who are oppressed, to help those who are suffering, uh, even if we are those people. And uh, we believe in having a relevant ministry, a ministry that is uh, sensitive to the times that we are in. Uh, for the past three months, we have been in our Cancel Culture series where we've been looking at the prophetic word of God. However, over the course of this month, uh, we are going to be taking a look at uh, the, 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 what is called the dark room. Uh, you may have seen the flyer already. And just so that you have a good sense of what the dark room is about, some of us remember a day and age when uh, photos were not always taken on your phone. Their photos were not always digital. Some of us remember a day and age where uh, somebody would take a photo with an actual camera and they would uh, pull out the film and there would be negatives there. And the thing with the dark room and with, the, with that kind of photography is that you needed to take it into a dark room in order for those photos to develop. And I just think that that's a powerful and relevant word for us today because we are living in some dark times, not only as people of color, but also uh, just in terms of Earth's history. And it's amazing how photography can speak to this moment and show us that God can use our negatives and develop them into something powerful, into something good. So I want you uh, to just notice that on uh, our, for this, for this month's program, uh, we're having several speakers join us. Pastor Troy Solomon Levy is with us today, uh, and he's going to be sharing with us some principles uh, regarding growth in our stewardship and growth in, in, in our trust in the Lord. Dr. Dean Knight is going to join us the Sabbath after that, and Dr. David Williams is going to join us the Sabbath after that. So we are excited to see how God is going to continue to move. In fact, this afternoon, uh, Pastor Solomon Levy, Troy Solomon Levy, is going to be with us this afternoon afternoon at 3.30 p.m. Be sure to tune back in on Facebook and on YouTube at 3.30 p.m. Uh, as we further go into a workshop on uh, how to grow in the ways that God has called us to in stewardship. So we're excited for you to be with us and to join us uh, as we are in this new year and charting out a new path and a new course uh, for the Lord to continue to guide us. Um, we are also celebrating Black History Month because Jesus modeled to us that he would pay special care and attention to the oppressed, whether it was the blind man on the side of the road, blind Bartimaeus, or it is the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, we have a special responsibility to care for those who uh, are suffering under oppression or prejudice. So I just want to encourage you uh, to not only allow your Black History Month celebration to be limited to the hours of this worship service, but also extend it to uh, those who are in need. Make sure that you're serving your community and that we are being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ wherever it is that we go. Uh, so I just want to welcome you once more. Thank you for being with us and joining us. Uh, I also want to introduce our speaker this afternoon. It is uh, Pastor Dr. Uh, Troy Levy, and he was born in Brooklyn, New York, and he was raised mainly on the East Coast. Uh, he spent his formative years being educated in Seventh-day Adventist institutions in the Allegheny East Conference. So he has gone to Pine Forge, and it is there that he met his wife, Rochelle, uh, and they started forming a strong bond there. Uh, he attended Oakwood University and graduated uh, in 2008. He completed his master's in divinity in 2010 from Andrews University. And he has recently earned a doctor of ministry in urban ministry at Andrews University, um, where he researched the intersection of race, religion, and financial literacy. And this is one of the reasons why we've brought him in today. Uh, Pastor Troy is the proud leader of the New Life Seven the Adventist Church in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, New Life is the church of his youth, and he is thrilled to return and to contribute to those that have poured into him during his formative years. Uh, Pastor Levy's main burden in ministry is to help people, especially young people, develop a true love for the Lord. He also desires to lead his parishioners in a faithfully in faithfully sharing the gospel with those who do not know Jesus. So I just ask that you continue to pray for him in his ministry, both this morning and this afternoon, as he shares the word of God with us. May the Lord continue to keep you and bless you as we receive the special music and then we hear uh, the word of the Lord from Pastor uh, Troy Solomon Levin. God bless you.
Hey, happy Sabbath, Cambridge. It is my extreme pleasure to worship with you in this capacity. I pray that you're having a wonderful Sabbath. God bless you and God bless your, your pastor, my uh, my friend, uh, Edsel. Um, he is a, a special pastor, as you already know. Uh, we were in seminary together uh, just for, I think, just for a few months, actually, uh, at the same time. 
Uh, but I feel blessed to have a brother, a soldier in the army of the Lord to fight next to um, and someone like uh, like him. So make sure you treat him well. Make sure that you appreciate him and uh, and his family. Uh, look, I, I just want to give one last shout out before we get into the text. Uh, and that is to all of the Patriots fans as you have to watch Tom Brady play for another team. Amen. In, in the Super Bowl tomorrow. <laughs> and, and, and look, uh, I, I, I'm an avid Eagles fan. Sorry to uh, to bring another team into the mix, but I am an avid Eagles fan. And our one claim to fame is that we beat y'all in the Super Bowl. Y'all have many Super Bowls. Don't be mad at me. I, let me just let me just dwell on that win from what three, four years ago. I'm gonna dwell on it as long as I can. But make sure you 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 do well. Watch the game tomorrow. Don't don't punk out. Amen. Watch the game tomorrow as Tom Brady brings maybe another win to another team. Now, with that being said, let's get into the word of God. Genesis chapter 31, starting with verse 38. Happy Black History Month to each of you as well, as we celebrate the accomplishments of people of color, particularly the the African-American community. Uh, And as we celebrate where God has brought us from and where he is taking us to, I believe that we have a wonderful destination if we hang in there with the Lord. Uh, your pastor asked me to speak to one of the issues that um, I don't want to say plague. That is a, b- a wrong word. Uh, one of the issues that that maybe speak to uh, or deal with uh, the African-American community um, that can help us to make better progress than we have already made. And that is financial literacy. That is something that I've been studying in depth for for about five, six, seven, maybe even seven years or so now. It is something that's really near and dear to my heart. So Genesis chapter 31, we're taking a look at Jacob's life, starting with verse 38. This is Jacob talking to Uncle Laban. He says, these 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. The, in, in the day, the drought consumed me and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus, I have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. Anyone ever feel cheated? Anyone ever feel like... Uh, you, 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 you're just being disparaged that, that look, this text is for you. Verse 42, unless the God of my father, here's where we can celebrate. Come on. The God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me unless God had been with me. Surely now you would have sent me away empty handed. Don't you know, is there anyone that realizes that if it weren't for the Lord on our side, that we would surely be empty handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Bow your heads with me as we consider the topic for today, leaving a legacy, leaving a legacy. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, as we approach this preaching moment, we ask for your Holy Spirit to bring us clarity and understanding so that as the word is being preached and as the word is being studied, that uh, we can be changed and transformed. We don't want just more knowledge. We don't want just more information. Lord, we want more transformation. We want a change of heart from the ways of the world to the ways of God. So Lord, please give us the courage to make a decision for you even today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you've ever watched a movie, maybe it's an action movie, maybe it was a sob movie, uh, and you've seen someone who is just wandering or, or wandering, I should say, through the desert, trudging step by step through the sand. Each step gets heavier and heavier as the person has the sun beating down on their brow. They're thirsty. They are uh, just so hungry, but but more so thirsty as well. They just need something to drink as the sweat has been pouring from their heads or every part of their body for hours 
upon hours, yea, even for days. You've seen it in the shows or in the movies before where they're so thirsty that they see something off into the distance that, that looks like uh, some verdant palm trees. And it looks like there's a spring that is snaking its way through the desert. Uh, there's some bushes there, some, 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 some greenery. And they rush to that spot where uh, they see this greenery only to find out that it's more and more sand. Uh, and you know that as I'm describing this, what they have seen wasn't an oasis, but it was actually a mirage, uh, something that they thought they saw, but wasn't actually there. When we look up the word mirage in the dictionary, it will tell you that it is a naturally occurring optical phenomenon in which light rays bend to produce a displaced image of distant objects on the horizon, a mirage, seeing something that isn't really there. Well, let me just tell you, and you're probably wondering why is this preacher preaching about a mirage? Well, the reason is because the story of Jacob has functioned as a mirage to me for my whole life. I had been seeing only one aspect of Jacob's story, and that aspect was a romanticized version of his love life. Now, by the way, Cambridge, this is not an attempt to dismiss nor even to minimize Jacob's love for Rachel at all. His love for her was a real love. It was a deep love. It says in the word of God that when Jacob saw Rachel for the very first time, this is Genesis 29 and verse 11, that he lifted up his voice and he wept. Now, fellas, I wonder, I can't help but wonder how beautiful Rachel must have been to make a brother cry when he sees her for the first time. And all the fellas said, amen. But not only did he admire Rachel, but Jacob was willing to put his money where his tears were. And it says that Jacob himself suggested to his uncle Laban that he worked for seven years to marry his daughter, Rachel. I didn't say seven days. I didn't say seven months. I said seven years. But the word of God doesn't leave it at that. Now, folk, if it were me working seven years, I assure you that I would have complained for about six and a half of those years. Pray for the preacher. Amen. Please pray for me. Put me on your prayer list. Look, and add insult to injury, I would have held it over Rachel's head and used it as leverage in our relationship. Girl, don't you know that I worked for seven years to have your hand in marriage? You're going to listen to me today. Come on and say amen. That's just me. But but the Bible paints a very different picture about Jacob. He didn't complain. He, he didn't do anything like that. In fact, it says in Genesis 29 and verse 20 that Jacob served seven years for Rachel and get this, and they seemed like they were only a few days to him. Why? Because of the love that he had for her. Now, ladies, if there was any man in the Bible that wives would want as an example for their husbands, it would be Jacob. And all the ladies said, amen. Now, Cambridge, this is the romanticized version or the romanticized side of Jacob's story that I'm referring to. But but the romance serves as a sort of mirage that covers up a very ugly truth. Because if we look closely, we, we see a struggle that wasn't part of God's ideal plan for Jacob's life. And the struggle begins in Genesis chapter 29, when we find Jacob journeying through the wilderness, just like the man or the person uh, in our sermonic introduction was journeying through the desert. Jacob was journeying through the wilderness. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Uh, and even though he has a destination, his journey was more like wandering because he's never been there before. Jacob barely had a friend in the world as he's left home on bad terms. He's sent to his uncle Laban's house to find a wife, but he knows that he can't go back home after that. Normally the culture was, hey, I'll go find a wife and bring her back to where my parents live, but he, he can't go home now. Jacob at this point is like a drifter. So he finally finds some shepherds as he's wandering. He finds them in a general area that he knows that Laban should live. And he inquires about Laban and he finds Rachel first, Laban's daughter. And then Rachel introduces Jacob to Uncle Laban. Now, 
Because Jacob is family, Laban lets Jacob stay with him for a month. That's what the Bible says, while they figure everything out. And I'm sure that 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 uh, uh, that during that time, Jacob tells Laban about the story of deceiving his brother Esau. He tells him the story of tricking his father Isaac and why he really has no home. And in hindsight, Jacob may have regretted pouring out his whole life story to Laban. Because I'm sure Laban is licking his chops as he listens to Jacob talk. Now, after that first month, after they figured everything out, Laban and Jacob enter into a, an agreement for Jacob to work for him for seven years. Now, Cambridge, he didn't get paid every week. He didn't get paid on the 15th and the 30th like, like I get paid. There was no direct deposit into his Bank of America account. His only paycheck came at the very end of the seven years, and that paycheck was in the form of a wife. Now, again, we, we, we romanticize Jacob's love, but the ugly side of the story is that Jacob wasn't just an employee of Laban's. No, 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 no. He, he wasn't his personal assistant or anything like that. The language of the text uses that of not personnel, but it uses the language of slavery. Jacob literally sells himself into slavery to Uncle Laban in order to get the things that he wanted. Okay, someone's still not hearing me, so let me put it a bit more clearly. Uh, let's say that Jacob indebted himself to get something that he wanted. He put himself in bondage. He put himself in debt to purchase something that he wouldn't be able to enjoy for another seven years in the future. People of God, the, the, the ugly side of this story is the negative position that debt puts anybody in. By the way, my, my thesis for this message is to help us understand that debt is not sophisticated. Debt isn't neutral. Debt can actually prevent us from living out our God-given destiny. Now, just to be clear, let me clarify something. The Bible does not call debt a sin. I want to be very upfront and clear about that. No one is transgressing, transgressing because they owe someone money. But the Bible does describe debt as slavery and is therefore unwise. Proverbs 22, verse 7, you don't believe me, so let me take you straight to the word of God. Proverbs 22, verse 7, it says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Folk, it doesn't say that the borrower is cool with the lender. It doesn't say that the borrower is friends with the lender or somehow benefiting from the lender. The Bible uses some very intentional language to describe the debtor's relationship to the lender, and it calls it slavery. This is very intentional. It's using this negative connotative word, negatively connotative word to describe the relationship that the debtor has with the lender. It is called slavery. Now, unfortunately, in our society, we've learned to view debt as something that's savvy or something that's smart or somehow rigging the system. And we've even put special labels on debt to make it sound cool, like gold card and platinum card and black card. It sounds so smooth and so savvy. But the truth of the matter is that the joke isn't on the lenders. The joke is actually on the borrower. We, we've somehow been led to believe that debt is something that we just can't do without in America, that you'll always have debt, that you, 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 no one will ever be able to do anything without having some sort of payments of some sort, that you can't live, that you can't move or have your being without debt, like as if debt is just God, uh, that, 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 that it, it's just crazy the way we've operated in our country with debt. Part of everyone's American dream is to have the home, have the car, and to have the education, to have the clothes. And these are things I'm not against, by the way. But many of us are up to our necks in payments trying to stay afloat. We make a lot more money than our parents do for most of us, but we're a lot more stressed about our finances. And now the American dream has turned into the American nightmare. It is scary, the amount of debt that we have accumulated in 
this country. It's scary. But I would suggest another approach that I believe is more in line with God's ideal. Are you ready for it? All right, here we go. When the Israelites were on the cusp of entering the promised land, God delineated some very simple blessings and curses to them. He told them, if you do this, then you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, then look, I I just can't give you my blessings, just like any good parent would do. So this is on top of the mountain. You you know this text already. Here are some of the blessings listed in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 12 through 13. It says, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. Now hear this, get, get this. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. This is part of the blessings. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And then verse 13, we can't miss this. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. We quote this in, in church all the time or quote it maybe in, uh, devotionally or uh, maybe anecdotally or what have you, that you shall be the head and not the tail. But many of us don't realize that the context of that blessing is within the sphere of borrowing and lending. God says, you shall, not, you, you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. The head and the tail thing is in the context of a financial relationship. You shall lend, but you shall not borrow. It's a blessing. But then on the flip side, get follow me now. Several verses later, God lays out some of the curses if they did not listen to him. Deuteronomy 28, same chapter, but later on, verses 43 and 44. Here's some of the curses. The foreigners who reside among you will rise above you higher and higher, but you will see lower and lower. They will lend to you, but you will not lend to them. And here we go again. They will be the head, but you will be the tail. Look, folk, borrowing money has never been a part of God's ideal plan for anyone that serves the Lord. From God's standpoint, it has never been a blessing. It has always been a curse. In fact, I would call debt a mirage that has every appearance of a blessing, every appearance of it. When you first ride in that new car, it has a a nice smell to it and it rides so smoothly on those Boston streets that you don't feel any potholes on the road. Come on and say amen. New pair of shoes that you put on that Macy's card make you look real nice and seems to even make you look sleeker and, 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 and stand a bit taller. But, but in the end, the interest payments drain the borrower of every cent that they have. And the shoes that you thought you were, pay, you were paying $50 for end up costing $100. And the mirage of debt is that it really leaves the borrower in more despair than he was in the first place. Can you just imagine with me what life would be like without student loans? Lord have mercy. Come on, let me just wave my hands. You should be waving your hands at home also. Imagine with me what life would be like without a car note to pay every month, without having to dodge the calls of bill collectors when you see that area code pop up or that number that you just don't recognize. You got to dodge and duck. And imagine how much peace in the home can be had when spouses aren't constantly bickering over money issues. Just imagine how it would be if God's vision for his people were a reality, that instead of borrowing, that we would actually lend to others. It's a great vision of possibility for the future. But I must admit that our present situation, especially as people of color, tends to be more bleak. The black-white wealth disparities continue to widen every single year. And by the way, the numbers haven't come out yet, I don't think. But when the numbers come out for 2020, after uh, after everything that has happened, and uh, yeah, even after 2021, after the quarantine is over, we hope the wealth disparities will be even more wide. I just about guarantee it. The Great Recession starting in 2008 damaged American families in general. It damaged everybody but it affected minority families much more than it did white families. Now, thankfully, black families have been able to build the average net worth up to $17,000 in value. Praise God. That means that for the everyday black family, if you took everything of value that we possess and added it all up, it would equal up to $17,000. That's home, that's car, that's valuables, bank accounts, retirement accounts, et cetera, minus how much debt we're carrying. Now, 
we can rejoice in that progress. Praise God. We, we praise God for progress. But the reality is that compared to our $17,000 net worth, white households have a net worth of $171,000. That's 10 times the net worth of black households. We are way behind. There's some disparities here. Disparities. There's something troubling about these wealth disparities. And, and while some of it, some of it can be attributed to systems and persons that have perpetuated the despondency of the African-American community, I do not want to jet past that. That is very true. With slavery, with redlining, with Jim Crow, with uh, e even with um, um, the uh, what is called the new Jim Crow, which is mass incarceration, all of these things have negatively affected the African-American community and have trickled down to affect our net worth and our financial understandings. Yes, that is very true. But on the flip side, a lot of it can also be attributed to our own unwise choices when it comes to managing our finances. It's both and, it's not just either or. I love what Dr. Henry Cloud says uh, when he says it this way. Many motivations or driving forces are not our fault. There are many things that are, we, we didn't enslave ourselves. We didn't come up with redlining. We didn't do all of that. Those things are not our fault. Then he goes on to say, but this does not mean that our behavior is not our responsibility. People of God, too many of our households are in slavery and we need to do something drastic as a community, drastic as families, drastic, as individuals, drastic, as churches, to get ourselves onto the right path. So Jacob sells himself into slavery to Laban for seven years in order to marry his bride, Rachel. Now, the next part of the story is not Jacob's fault. We already talked about there's some things that aren't our fault. This next part wasn't Jacob's fault. But I, I need us to see I, I need us to see what the result of the initial slavery can end up being. It says that after his seven years were finished, that there was a huge wedding celebration in that community. Now, traditionally, the father escorts the bride into the bedroom chamber that night, and the husband comes into the chambers after the father leaves to consummate the marriage. Now, unfortunately, Jacob didn't find out until morning that who he thought was his true love, Rachel, the night before, was actually her older and unattractive sister, named Leah. He couldn't help that. He didn't know that. Now, after arguing with Laban about it, Laban agrees to give Rachel to him the following week, but only in exchange for another seven years of slavery. So he worked seven years for Leah, seven years for Rachel. Then he worked another six years after that. He worked 20 years for Laban in servitude and slavery to him. Now you can't miss, I got to emphasize this fact, what seemed initially like seven years of slavery ended up being 20 years of slavery. We, we know how these things go. You, you never plan to, 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 to really use the credit card except for emergencies. But, but 20 years later, you're, you're, you're in debt and you're 10,000, 20,000, 30 to 50,000 dollars in debt. You never knew how far that initial. Uh, uh, that 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 initial indebtedness would take. You never knew how far it would take you. You never knew how long you would struggle with paying off your debt. And it started with the one decision. Look, my point is that when we enter into debt, it almost always ends up being worse than what we had originally signed up for. That's just the nature of it. Things happen. Problems come up. Emergencies occur where we missed several months of payments and now we're in default on the loans, which creates his own set of problems, stress, mangled relationships, distrust, time wasted on the phone on hold, trying to get an agent to talk to, to sort things out. Rarely does the price of a debt end up only being the advertised sticker price. Jacob never would have imagined that the original seven years would have been three times longer than what he had agreed to. He never would have imagined his life at that point. But unfortunately, it's not just Jacob that it happens to. The same things happen in our communities today. In our communities, uh, we have targeted, targeted payday loan shops 
which by the way, aren't in, uh, when we travel to other communities that don't look like us, they're not there. They're mainly in black and brown communities targeted towards our people, payday loan shops, the uh, legal form of what used to be, used to be called mafia loan sharks. Get this. And you're probably going to think I'm exaggerating. I am not. They charge up to 700% interest on their loans. Can you imagine that? 700%. Many of us looking at our car note at, at I don't know, 15, 20%. We're like, oh, Lord, this thing is crazy. 700% interest on their loans, which means that when someone borrows $300 to pay the Eversource bill, to put the lights back on, after a year, if they carry that debt for a year, they end up paying back $2,400 instead of the original $300 loan, $2,400. Debt is killing our neighbors. It's killing our communities. It's killing our homes. It's killing our ambitions, our dreams, our hopes are dashed away because of debt. Folk, debt is not savvy. Debt is not sophisticated. Debt is preventing us from living out our God-given destiny. It's crazy. Towards the end of the story, Jacob complains to Laban that everything he has is Laban's. He said that his wives and his children are Laban's, be Laban's because of his slavery. At the end of 20 years of indebtedness, Jacob doesn't have anything to his name. Nothing. He has nothing to call his own. Every, the clothes on his back are Laban's, his socks, his sandals. The, the sheet that is everything is Laban's. And get this, Genesis chapter 30 and verse 30 is so sad that when I realized how deep Jacob was into his shame, tears literally came to, came to my eyes. He says, Genesis 30, verse 30, talking to Laban, um, you had little before I came, but your wealth has increased enormously. The Lord has blessed you through everything that I've done. But now... What about me? When can I start providing for my own family? You can hear the despair in Jacob's voice. I I've done all this to build you up. Capital One, I've built you up. Bank of America, I've built you up. I have done everything for me. You have my interest. You have my paycheck. I've lived paycheck to paycheck. I haven't bought a house yet, or if I have bought a house, I'm, I'm 30 years more, I'm paying the next 30 years in, in, in interest pay. I haven't been able to build myself up yet, but all of y'all, y'all CEOs are, are able to sit nice and, and heavy, and I'm not against CEOs, you know, but I'm just saying that we have done the work of building everybody else up around us. When can we start providing for our own? When? And I'm here to tell you <clears throat> that that's the nature of being in debt. The debtor enriches the owner and not himself. That's the nature of it. The borrower, the Bible says, is slave to the lender. And no man can serve two masters. No man. It's no wonder that not everyone returns a faithful tithe and offering. It's no wonder that when it's time to fundraise for a capital improvements project that we can't get 100% participation. Pastor, I know you can't say amen, so uh, Pastor, I'm, I'm going to say amen for you. It, it's no wonder that when it's time to send the Pathfinders to Oshkosh, it's like pulling teeth to get folk to donate. I, and I'm naive enough to believe that, that there are many who would like to give. But because we've grown accustomed to being up to our necks in debt, barely hanging on with our payments, that we literally cannot give because of our monthly payments and, and the interest that's eating at our paychecks every single week. Cambridge, when we're enslaved in debt, it's literally not possible to serve God to the best of our ability. I didn't say you can't serve God being in debt. I'm, please don't misunderstand. I'm just saying to the best of our ability, it is impossible to serve God and to serve the lender. It is impossible to serve God to, to the best of our ability when we're in debt. I know it's a tough message to, 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 to hang on to, to accept, but I'm, I'm, I'm not here to, to, to kick us, kick us down. Amen. I, I'm here to encourage us. And I, and I think the Bible has an answer for our dilemma 
as as Black Americans and and uh, and and uh, whoever else that that may be listening to me. And the Bible has an answer for Jacob as well, right? I, I'm here to give you some encouragement. Are you ready for an encouragement? Are you ready for the Bible's answer to the dilemma of debt? Are you ready for it? All right. If you're ready for it, we we have to rewind the story and back up several chapters uh, and back up several chapters to find it. We have to go to Genesis chapter 24 and, and take a look at Jacob's father, Isaac. That's who his father was. Jacob's father, Isaac. Let, read with me. Follow with me. This is Genesis 24, verses 1 through 4, and then I'm going to skip over to verse 10. Here it is. It says, now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to a servant, the oldest of his household, by the way, that was Eliezer, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, verse three, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Verse 10, pay very close attention to this. If you're following along with me in the scriptures, I need you maybe to even underline this, pay attention. It says, then the servant, Eliezer, took 10 of his master's camels. Camels are not cheap. You know that. And departed, taking, hear this again, all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Now, the story goes that Eliezer got to the city of Nahor. He asked the Lord for a sign and God gives him the sign as to who should be Isaac's wife when he meets Rebecca. Now, let's skip over to same chapter, Genesis 24, and verses 20, 22 through 23. It says, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two braces for her arms, weighing 10 gold shekels. Verse 23, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Now, Eliezer goes to Rebecca's father's home and Rebecca's brother sees the ring and the bracelets, which were bridal gifts. And Rebecca's brother gets excited and runs back in to tell his father. Now, stick with me. Very important detail. Who is Rebecca's brother? Yeah, yeah. for all of the Bible, Bible scholars out there, you said Laban and you are absolutely correct. Rebecca's brother is Laban. Very important detail. Stay right there. Stick a pin in there. Let me keep on moving. Their father comes out and Eliezer, Abraham's servant, tells him why he's there and how God led him in his journey. Now, when their father learns that Eliezer wants to take Rebecca back home to be Isaac's wife, her father gives his general blessing, but then the negotiations for her begin. Eliezer had already given her the ring and the bracelets. But the Bible, and those were heavy items, and th those were 100% gold as, as far as we know. But the Bible starts listing the other things that he gave her family. Genesis 24, verse 53. It says, and the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave to her brother Laban and to her mother costly ornaments. Eliezer came with it. He came with it. Like he was like, hey, who, who, who wants gifts? I got plenty of gifts to go around. Just let me get Rebecca. Let me bring her back to marry Isaac and we're good, right? Here's what I'm trying to get at. Eliezer didn't go looking for Isaac's wife empty-handed. Okay. All right. Someone's still not, still not getting it. <laughs> Jacob went to Laban empty-handed. Eliezer didn't go looking for Isaac's wife empty. And by the way, Jacob was looking for why it's the same exact situation, same scenario. Jacob left home intentionally looking for a wife. Eliezer went out to the city of Nahor looking for a wife for Isaac. Same situation. The only difference is that Jacob left home empty handed and Eliezer didn't go empty handed. He utilized the wealth of Abraham, Isaac's father. It mentions the weight of gold that he put on Rebecca. And if the story happened in the year 2021, the gold will be worth more than $5,000, right? And that was the engagement ring, if you want to call it that. That was the engagement ring of that time. Maybe it was a steep cost. But the cost of $5,000 for that engagement ring was nowhere near the cost of 20 years of indentured servitude. Nowhere near that cost. 
The difference is that Eliezer went to get what he had or went to get what he wanted rather with leverage and Jacob had no leverage. I'm, I'm trying to talk to folk. I'm trying to talk some leverage into our people. Eliezer went with all the money that he needed in his hand so that he could pay for what he wanted up front with cash. With cash. He paid for, I hate to, to talk about a, a wife or a woman like that, but you know, th 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 this was the situation. This is not a, a reflection on what I believe uh, should happen. But he went and paid for the wife up front with cash. That was not an option for Eliezer. Please get this in our heads. It was not an option. He brought the cash, paid for what he wanted up front, and he was done with it. And, and, and don't miss this in the scriptures. Just in case you believe that I'm, I've gone too far, do not miss this. What's really revealing in Eliezer's story is the trick that they tried to pull on him, right? Don't miss this. Genesis, check this out. Genesis 24, verses 54 through 56. And now I'm going to skip uh, uh, skip to another verse. It says, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, hey, send me away to my master. Abraham's waiting for me. Now, verse 55, her brother, talking about Rebecca's brother, whom you know as Laban, let's take that pin out, go back to Laban. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us for, for a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. Verse 56, and that, now they trying it. You, you understand, because Laban did the exact same thing to Jacob later on in life. All right, but let's keep reading the scripture. Verse 56, but he said to them, do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. In verse 61, thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now, folks, when it was time for Eliezer to leave, Laban tried his shenanigans again. And he wanted Eliezer to stick around for 10 days. Yeah, look, hey, come on, brother. Stick around a little bit. And, and, and you know what Laban was trying to do. He was trying to cook up a plan to squeeze as much out of Eliezer as he possibly could as he did to La Jacob later on in the story. But because Eliezer had leverage, and by the way, Laban, he's been this way for a long time. Look, but, but because Eliezer had leverage with Abraham's legacy of wealth, he can up and go as he, when he said, look, man, I gave you what you, what you needed. He can up and go as he wanted to. And, and the reality is that when Jacob went to Laban's house, he had nothing with him except for the staff in his hand. And because he didn't have the legacy of his father's estate, he was forced to make decisions that put him 20 years behind God's destiny for him. It was never God's design. It was never God's plan for him to be in debt like that. He told the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, look, I want to give you the promise. That I want to give you Canaan. But because, and there were some other issues with, with his family that, that kind of worked out in, in that plan, why he was behind God's destiny, but certainly... Being in debt put him years and years behind God's plan for him. And I'm, I'm confident that for many of us, most of us, we are behind God's destiny for our lives because of debt. It is not a blessing. It has always been a curse in God's eyes. Many of us can't stay away from debt. Maybe it's because of how we were raised, maybe because of uh, our, our environment, you know, everyone else around us is in debt. So, you know, we don't know anything different, but I'm telling you that the Bible has something different for us and it is using cash up front by way of using the leverage that we have leverage. And in our communities, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if we had, or if we were able to utilize the leverage, the wealth, of our ancestors, the wealth of our families, our own wealth that we've built up for ourselves. How many times, uh, maybe if our communities or our, our, our boys and our young ladies have been abused or have been mistreated by those that are in power, uh, maybe if we had the leverage, uh, maybe that wouldn't happen. Now that, that very well could be a far, a far cry, but who knows? I'm just saying that money talks. And when we have the leverage to use, then things do happen. 
And I'm, I'm pleading with us, I'm, I'm begging us to utilize the leverage that we have. Without being sold into debt, Jacob's wages would have never been changed 10 times by Uncle Laban. He was able to do that to Jacob because Jacob had no leverage. He was being abused and being maligned. And many in our communities are being abused and maligned also because we don't have the leverage. But when we have cash, when we have wealth and not selling ourselves into slavery by way of debt, we now have leverage because we have the money in our pockets and not in somebody else's. Debt is not neutral. Debt prevents us from living out our God-given dreams and destiny. And my appeal for us today, very simple, is to stay away from debt. Well, Pastor, I'm I'm, I'm a student. I, I need student loans. Look, man, I need you to work, man, as, as hard as possible. <laughs> I need you to be filling out scholarships or maybe go, go into another school that doesn't require as much. So, look, I... I I've had to pay off. It's taken me years and years to pay off student loans. We had to do it. It was a lot of money. I'm talking about $100,000. It was a lot. I wish that I did not. I've had it all. Credit card debt. We'll talk more about it in th th this afternoon. But I wish that I had stayed away from debt. Made that decision earlier on in my life. But I made a decision years ago that I was going to pay it off and never be involved in it again. And that decision has Paid, very, paid off very, very well in my life, praise God. Just like as Jacob was wandering in the wilderness with not a friend in the world from his home and he hadn't yet made it to Uncle Laban's house. You remember he had fallen asleep in that wilderness with a rock under his head as a pillow and he was just scared. He didn't have a dime to his name, but God promised him, he said, look, man, I will be with you. Well, look, God, I, I haven't made the best decisions in life. It doesn't matter. I will be with you. God, I, I'm in debt up to my neck. I don't know what to do. I will be with you. And God, he is the best leverage that we could ever have. So that even when we have made bad decisions with money, even when we haven't made the best decision, even when we've operated under the curse of God in terms of, of, of debt and, and, and uh, being slave to the borrower, and to the lender and whatnot, it doesn't matter because God has promised that he will be with us. And as you're making your decision, I'm asking you to raise your hand right now to stay away from debt, period, as much as possible, with the exception of a, of a home. But look, when we make that decision, God is promising, look, I will be with you to cover over your mistakes. Just make a decision to operate with your money on my plan that's written in my word. When we do that, by show of hands, God has promised, look, man, I will cover over you. I will be with you. Let's say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the word of God that teaches us, Lord God, how to live not just high and mighty principles of the word, but Lord, this is just regular old wisdom, Lord, found in the book of Proverbs, found in the book of Genesis, wisdom that sets us down the right path to serve you as much and as best as we possibly can. We believe that. So Lord, please help us to utilize our money that you have given us according to your laws and your rules and your wisdom. Lord, we're tempted to go the other way. Lord, just set us straight and help us always remember that your presence is assured to us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Levy, for the word. Uh, it's just amazing to see how the Bible doesn't leave any stone unturned. It just covers every aspect of life. Uh, and uh, I know that I was encouraged to, to stay away from debt. And I think it's, you know, it's important not only in Black History Month, but for our church. Uh, I've heard so many of us say things like, man, I wish I had dot, dot, dot. 
so I can do this in ministry, so that I can do that in ministry. And the link that we should be making here is that we are not pursuing uh, uh, freedom from debt just for the sake of the American dream, but rather for the sake of our heavenly dream so that we can fulfill the mission that God has given us. We see, as Pastor uh, Levy pointed out, how many times uh, have we wanted to, to fund this or to send kids to Oshkosh or do different things in our community. And we don't even often see that debt and that a lack of stewardship is an attack on the mission that God has given us, uh, that the enemy is attacking us from all of these different angles. So we believe that, it's that is, it is our responsibility as a church, if we're going to make appeals for, for fundraising, if we're going to make appeals for offering, that we are actually equipping you, our church family, and our church and our and our wider community on how to save, how to avoid avoid debt, how to experience financial freedom, not so that we can buy the car, right? If you buy the car, that's your choice, but so that we can support ministry, so that we can support mission in the ways that God has called us to, uh, so that you can uh, serve the, the, the needy, so that you can be uh, the lender to those who are in need. And I believe that God is calling us to that. So I just want to encourage you. Uh, I know that this word today, uh, it pricked us as it should have. But this afternoon at 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, Pastor Levy is going to be back with us and we're going to be going through a workshop that is going to put tools in our hands on how to avoid debt, how to... Um, how to avoid uh, 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 allowing your ministry to be stifled by uh, a lack of a lack of stewardship. Uh, how to avoid poverty. What we see in the story of Jacob is that uh, because he left so quickly after stealing the birthright, uh, he didn't bring a legacy with him. He just he just went into Laban's hands and he wasn't prepared for that. So we want to make sure uh, that we are being more like Eliezer, putting into your hands the tools and the 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 equipping you need so that you can walk into situations fully equipped and, and fully prepared. Uh, I'm excited for this afternoon at 3:30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're looking at the stewardship blueprint, uh, looking at financial freedom uh, and freedom to carry forth the mission. Uh, and at this time, we typically make an appeal for offerings. So I just, I do want to encourage you uh, to return a faithful tithe and a faithful offering as we continue to 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 advance the mission of the Lord. Uh, a few ways that you can give is by going to cambridgesda.org, click the give button, and go ahead and return a tithe and a, and an offering, a faithful tithe and your offering. You can also download the Adventist Giving app. Um, it's a quick and easy way to give, to partner with this ministry, and to continue to take the gospel uh, throughout the community of Everett, throughout the area of Massachusetts, and throughout the world as well. And you can go ahead and mail your tithe and offering to Cambridge uh, at 43 Norwood Street, Everett, Massachusetts, 02149. Uh, we praise God for your faithfulness. We praise God for how God has... Um, how God has already blessed you and how you uh, continue to pour that blessing out on to others. I want to encourage you once more. We live in a world saturated with a capitalistic mindset. Our pursuit of financial freedom is not about us. It's not about me. It's not about so I can do this. And so I can, it, it is recognizing that I want to support my community. I want to be somebody who pours into those who are in need and supports them and educates them and allows them to experience the freedom so that they can be free, not only financially, but also emotionally. So they don't have to carry the stress and the burden of, man, I, I can't do ministry here because I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet over there. Uh, this can be a powerful ministry to others. So I want to encourage you to join us this afternoon, 3.30. Uh, Pastor Troy Levy is going to be with us with the Stewardship Blueprint. Um, and we pray that you will receive the tools you need in order to be a blessing to your community. Um, I want to make a few more announcements before we close out in prayer. Uh, the New England North area is holding a series of programs uh, that is going to strengthen us. It's going to encourage us. Uh, and next Sabbath at 3.30 in the afternoon, we're meeting on Zoom. This is the Cambridge Zoom, so it should be familiar to you. Uh, and we're covering topics of mental health. There are going to be breakout rooms uh, for our children, for our teens, for our, our teens and youth, for our parents, uh, for our young adults, and for our our seniors. So uh, the, we are bringing in uh, professionals and specialists who are going to work with you uh, and give you tools that you need in order to just overcome some of the challenges that we have been facing in this pandemic and also in this day and age. So we, we encourage you to be with us and to join us. Um, let's close out in prayer. 
Father, we thank you for your love towards us. God, we're grateful that um, your word just continues to show us the path that you have called us to. And Lord, we although we recognize that uh, debt is not a sin, Lord, we, we sense that you have more in store for us than the lives that we have been living. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you would instill in our hearts discipline, uh, discipline to not pursue that that trivial cost or uh, those expenses that keep on racking up those subscriptions that continue to drain us, Lord. Uh, but God, that you would give us a clear vision of your plan for our life so that we can say no to the things that are trivial and so that we can make room for the purpose you have for us. Lord, I pray even now for the finances of all those who are watching, all those who are tuning in, Lord. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would uh, pour out onto them, Father. I pray that you would teach them how to cut costs in the places that they need to, Father, uh, and so that we can operate with the wisdom and with the savvy uh, that represents your children and that lays hold of the covenant promise that you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us all with our various concerns and with our needs. We lay them at your feet, trusting that you will respond and trusting that your way is best. Continue to bless us, continue to provide for us, and continue to make us faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for this worship service. May the peace of God continue to rest upon your heart. God bless.